Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors, everyone. I'm Corey Janoff, joined as always by Rochelle Vanderzanden. How's it going, Corey? It's going. Good. Uh, <laughs> typical Wednesday. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Um, so today we wanted to talk about, uh, you know, despite our world, our lives, personal lives, the world around us seeming like it's constantly in flux, never stable and continuing to evolve over time, there's some things that remain the same. There's, there are some constants in life. So we wanted to focus on that and as always, somehow tie it back into your personal finances because we've found if you look close enough and hard enough, everything somehow ties into personal finances one way or another. Um But I wanted to kick it off with, there's a great quote by Jeff Bezos. You've probably all heard of him. He's the guy who started Amazon. And uh, you've probably heard of Amazon. Um, If not, get deliveries from them daily. But, uh, you know, his quote is, I very frequently get asked the question, what's going to change in the next 10 years? And that is a very interesting question. It's a very common one. I almost never get the question, what's not going to change in the next 10 years? And I submit to you that the second question is actually the more important of the two, because you can build a business strategy around the things that are stable in time. In our retail business, we know that customers want low prices, and I know that's going to be true 10 years from now. They want fast delivery. They want vast selection. It's impossible to imagine a future 10 years from now where the customer comes up and says, Jeff, I love Amazon. I just wish the prices were a little higher. Or I love Amazon. I just wish you'd deliver your stuff a little more slowly. Impossible. And so the effort we put into those things, spinning those things, we know the energy we put in today will still be paying off dividends for our customers 10 years from now. When you have something that you know is true, even over the long term, you can afford to put a lot of energy into it. And I think that's really interesting because you know, you look at interviews with, you know, perceived really smart people who've who've done great things in the the business world and and, and it's common to ask, you know, you think of them as visionaries, like, hey, what do we expect the future to look like? Because as humans, we crave that certainty. We want to know what to expect down the road. But if you are running a business, it's pretty smart. What's not going to change? And let's just focus on that, that thing and repeating it and perfecting it and getting better at it and uh, dominating the market as a result. Yeah. I think it's interesting because we've done a couple of episodes on predictions and things like that. And when we think about these predictions and these people that we have a lot of faith in being able to tell us what's going to happen next, we're always thinking about the things that may change. We're not thinking about the things that are more stable. So we, we can make some predictions pretty, you know, pretty like confidently like that that there's some things that just don't change over time and and maybe we should focus more of our energy on that and stop worrying about all the things that are changing all the time so i think it it can be helpful to plan around the things that are a little more stable for sure so Mm -hmm. let's focus on that today what's what's going to remain the same rather than trying to time the market think about what the future is going to look like let's you know what's going to be constant moving forward so yep one thing we've talked about plenty of times, but you know how your savings rate matters probably more than anything when it comes to personal finances. But if you want to retire, you need to live below your means and save a portion of your earnings. A hundred years ago, that was true, and a hundred years from now, that's going to be true. If if you want to have a nest egg, you got to save a chunk of your earnings toward that future. And sure, the investment accounts, the types of investments, you know, are going to change over time, but the need to save a portion of each paycheck will always be important. And I don't see a scenario where that's ever going to change unless, you know, the world blows up, but then it's not an issue at that point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think another thing, and a lot of this is behavioral more than anything else, but humans can be inherently lazy. I don't think that that is necessarily true across the board, but I do think that more often than not, we take the path of least resistance. And it's not necessarily a bad thing either. Yeah. It's like we would rather exert the least amount of energy possible if given Some of it's about efficiency, right? Yeah. Yeah. So- And and we can think about this in our daily lives too. You know, if there's a bowl of M&Ms on the kitchen counter, they're probably going to get eaten fairly quickly. 
you know, unless they're always there, then maybe they get boring and maybe we don't eat them anymore. <laughs> but if you keep your M&Ms and your high treats up in the up in the cupboard, you know, not just for your your kid's sake or your dog's sake, but for your sake. So they're a little bit less accessible and you have to get out a stool to climb up and get them. It's going to be less likely that you eat it. Maybe you even forget about it. Eventually, you just don't eat the treats anymore. I literally did this with holiday candy. Like I often offload a lot of my own candy on my kid because she's fine and she can handle it. And she is pretty good with moderation. So that's good. I don't have to worry about it too much. But like I I have candy that is given to me personally. I'm like, people shouldn't give me candy. They should know better because I have less self-control. <laughs> So I literally put it up on the highest shelf and I am not super tall, which means I had to get out a stepladder every time I wanted to break into that candy, which I did once in a while, but less than if it had just been right on the counter and, and easily accessible for me. And I think the opposite can be true as well. I think a lot of the times the reason that we maybe don't eat quite as healthily is because maybe there's some prep work associated with it. Like it's easy to get, grab crackers or chips or whatever. It's not as easy to make a salad. You know, it's not that much harder either, <laughs> but it's not as easy. So I do find that if I make it easier for myself by prepping some things ahead of time, it can be really helpful. So if I know I like chopped broccoli in my salad, if I get the head of broccoli and I chop it all up and I put it in the refrigerator and it's already chopped, I will be much more likely to put that in my salad. Or if I make, you know, like whatever grain I want in my salad ahead of time, this is like giving way too much about my my eating habits away. But let's say, you know, I want to like put some wheat berries in my salad. I'm not going to make them like the second I want to eat my salad. But if they're already in the refrigerator, I will eat them, which is great. So you can prepare yourself to eat healthier. You can prepare yourself to eat less junk just by being strategic about where you put things in your home and how much you've prepped ahead of time. Yeah, I like it. Speaking of food, we could do a whole podcast on food alone, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, we uh, we made tacos the other night and I made this like avocado salsa where you threw avocados, cilantro, lime, jalapeno, some spices in a blender or I, I oh. use the food uh, immersion blender. Yeah. And it's like it's a game changer. You get the perfect ratio of avocado to lime to jalapeno in every bite of your taco rather than like putting a slice of avocado and a thing of cilantro and a yeah. slice of jalapeno or like your mouth's burning on that one bite. So does it stay good or does it turn brown? That's the no, question. It stays good. Like we have, it, this was two nights ago. It's still a very bright <gasps> green jar in our fridge. I mean, it's probably not going to last for weeks, but a couple of no. days. So but yeah, it's the magic and of it's, lime. Right it there. takes like five minutes to make, you know, like I the washing it. of the veggies took longer than the blending it. So yeah. Um, but yes, reverse engineer the, the good choices into your life and the bad. So, so that the right choice is the easy choice, you know, as we get older, you know, it becomes more important to probably eat healthier. You know, when I was in college, I could go to, you know, get a, a, a triple cheeseburger with a milkshake and fries and crush it. And, you know, not even go, worry about it. Yeah. Not even worry about it. Go play <laughs> basketball an hour later. Now it's, if I did that, I'd be down for the count for a while. Um, so, you know, buy healthy snacks instead of the potato chips, you know, chop up the broccoli when you get it and you have some time. So it's ready to go when you want to try and make that salad, lay out your exercise clothes the night before so that you just step right into them when you wake up rather than having to go out of your way to, to get that morning workout in. But you know, from a financial standpoint, automate the the savings. Uh, you know, we, we ought, with workplace retirement plans, it's usually pretty easy. You know, you set it up to automatically pull from your paycheck, but automatically do it for your kids' college accounts, for your own brokerage accounts. Um, you know, the IRA is usually is more of an annual thing, but I suppose you could you know set it up as an automated annual or just set a reminder on your calendar every single year. Fund IRA on your birthday or whatever pick a random day of the year that you're going to do it and just automate that uh you know so you don't have to think about it automate the rebalancing of your investment accounts that's pretty easy to do with uh, at least workplace retirement plans most have that feature i don't know about you know retail custodians like the vanguards and fidelities of the world if there's an automatic rebalance feature i know for us we can set it up 
pretty easily to do that for our clients. Um, don't put the Robinhood app on your phone. You know, it'll make you make it a lot easier to check your accounts and trade the stocks in your account. Make yourself log into your computer to see it. Don't auto save your username and password. Like make it a cumbersome process to go in and look at your accounts and make changes because like there's been a ton of studies out there that show the less you look at your accounts, the better they perform. You know, we're another human trait. We feel like we need to to tinker and tweak and and modify and improve. And and yeah, that might work with your your recipes that you're making at home. Um, but it, it generally is counterproductive with your investments. So, you know, try to just set it and forget it. And, you know, you need to occasionally take a look at it, but the less often, the better and the more automated and robotic it is, odds are it'll be better for you. Yep. I think it's also true with insurance planning where you do a review, you get it done on the front end, so you don't have to think about it anymore and you don't have to worry about it anymore. You know, if you just have the disability insurance in place, you have the life insurance in place, you know you selected an appropriate term length. Like maybe we have to review it in a few years, but it's pretty much set. You know, there's just less that you have to to do actively, which is really, really, really helpful. Set up auto pay so you don't forget to pay your premiums and the oh policy gosh. lapses. I don't know what I would do without auto pay nowadays. Our parents used to have to pay all these bills with checks. Like, how did they do that? <laughs> they would balance a checkbook. Like yeah. my mom, I remember she'd like have her checkbook at the store and she'd write a check you know, right in the ledger, what it was for, the date, the amount, et cetera. I'm like, man. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's one thing that we should backtrack on a little bit. I think it's a little too easy to spend money nowadays with credit cards and like everything's online. So, you know, maybe some things that you could do to create those barriers for yourself is delete the Amazon app off your phone. If you know, like Prime now, now one click, buy. <laughs> right? <laughs> Make it easy to go to your library on your phone and do the one-click hold request. <laughs> but at Amazon, you got to jump through all the hoops to buy the things. Like, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think Jeff Bezos obviously knows that people are lazy too. And he made it so that it's very, very, very easy to buy things on Amazon. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I think another just sort of universal truth is that pain can be a good thing and we associate it with negative things, but realistically, physical pain is an evolutionary trait. Like we feel pain for a reason, and it is a good thing that we feel pain. So Corey looked up some information on a woman named Gabby Gingris. Is that how you saw her last name? Do you I know? Don't, I have no Gingris. idea. Gal named Gabby from Minnesota. Gabby. Yeah, from Minnesota. She had a rare condition. I, I think people have heard of this condition where they, she had a congenital insensitivity to pain with, I don't know what that word is either, Corey. I can't. And hydrosis, yes. You doctors out there probably know what we're talking about more than we do. But she can't feel pain, long story short. And at first glance, you might think of that as a superpower. Like, I can do anything. I don't even feel pain. But in reality, it's the opposite. You know, she injured herself a few times as a child because she couldn't feel pain. Um, feel pain. You know, she chewed on her tongue to the point where she couldn't drink fluid. She had broken teeth from biting toys. She broke her jaw. She scratched her eyes to the point that the doctors had to sew her eyelid shut. Like, this is horrifying. Then she's legally blind. But that ability to feel pain tells us to stop doing something. That is a good thing. It tells us, like, we should stop and protect ourselves from those wounds and things like that. So, you know, if you touch a hot stove, you're not going to do it again. That teaches you a lesson. And the only way to improve your physical fitness is to feel a little bit of discomfort. Like, that's, there's like, a little bit of truth to good pain. <laughs> you know, like when you're working hard enough, your body should feel it. And it, and you kind of know this almost inherently, like your body feels good when you feel that kind of pain. Like it is a good sort of like stretching your muscles, mild discomfort. And that's kind of how you should feel with your finances. Like there should be this stretching your muscles, slight discomfort, but also like a fear of pain to keep things in check so we don't do things too dramatic. You know, like there's you overdid it if you spent too much and now you've overdrafted your checking account. Like there's a fear of that kind of pain that is very real and very appropriate. So we don't want to take on too risky investments because we're afraid of losing all of our money. Well, that makes sense. We don't we maybe have some proper insurance in place so that if something terrible happens, you know, we've got a little bit of a backup plan. 
Um, and we don't want to be poor when we're retired because we want to do fun things. So hopefully we save some money for retirement also. So there's all of these other fears that are associated with our financial well-being that can be very healthy as well. Yeah, and you doctors can can relate to the pain thing with your patients. Like if you're prescribing painkillers when they're recovering from surgery or procedure, whatever the issue is, like, yes, you want them to, you know, relieve from some of the pain so they can sleep at night, but, but you don't want to completely numb it. You know, one, there's, you know, obviously issues with, you know, people being addicted to painkillers in this country, but like you need to be able to feel your wounds so you will protect them. Like you, 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 it, otherwise, you know, you're more likely to, to tear open your sutures or something. Um, you know, so, so a pain, like us, like we were talking about a, a small degree of pain is a good thing for, you know, both us in, in the form of recovery, you know, on the, the exercise piece of it, like when you're lifting weights, like you're, if you do it right, you know, you don't overdo it, but you, you actually get like tiny little tears in your muscle fibers and your body repairs those with more muscle. And that's how your muscles grow. Um, you know, so you have to have that tiny little bit of discomfort and, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's important, uh, because, you know, I think we might talk about this in a little bit later, but like the, the feeling that that pain to some degree, like it's going to make you appreciate things a little bit more on the back end too. If everything comes easy for you, it's not going to be as great as if you have to suffer a little bit to, to get through it and, and get to that end goal on the other side. So, mm -hmm. yep. Like it's part of that self-preservation instinct too. You know, we have that fear of pain. And so we do our best to protect ourselves from it. I think another one slightly unrelated is just diversification. You know, at, at the most extreme examples, having all of your wealth tied up in one thing means if something happens to that thing, you no longer have wealth period. So like, that's what we don't want to do. <laughs> um, but I think the other thing about diversification, and this is something that's really important to know, is that when we diversify, we spread out our risks a little bit. But it also means that when you review your investments, you're never going to have the best performing portfolio. And you're also never going to have the worst performing portfolio. Because by its nature, if you have various things within your investments, you can't have the best or the worst thing. <laughs> like it's going to have some of each of those things. And so it's going to be somewhere in between. And so it, it's important not to be like chasing returns with a diversified portfolio because you're automatically going to reach to like undiversify yourself. And if that diversification is the goal, like that's that's not going to be productive. Um, yeah. So, you know, don't go chasing returns. That's, that's going to be a little counterproductive. But also just know that it's never going to be like the top thing. Like you're never going to be like, I won this year. No one beat me if you have a diversified portfolio. Oh, I think you're on mute, Corey. For sure. Good. Call. There we go. And I did notice, Rochelle, we were having an issue with some of the stuff saving because I was looking like we're missing a section that I added this morning, but I pulled oh, no. it up on my end. Okay. Um, but uh but yeah, no, diversification is, obviously is important. You never know what's going to do well from one year to the next. Um, taste change, regulations change, demographic shift, et cetera. Um, so you know, spreading around your, your risk so that you're always invested in the best thing is important, but also so you're never overly exposed to the worst thing is, uh, is also important. Um, I'm going to jump to the things that I added and then let you jump back to the risk reward sure. and the death and taxes. So I think another thing, striving for a goal um, and is going to continue to push people forward. So if you're just content with where your life is at, you're probably not going to try and you know continue to grow, continue to uh, improve, et cetera. Um, the ascent is more rewarding than that final destination. You know, I've heard many stories of people who achieve their lofty life goals, career goals, et cetera. They climb to the top of the mountain only to say, is this it? That's all like, you know, what's next. Um, and you know, I've seen studies reference that conclude the joy you get from planning a vacation often exceeds the actual joy from the vacation itself. 
So it's uh, there's something about looking forward to you know ex, you know the, that that future end result that, that in some cases is more uh, rewarding than the end result itself. And I think to some degree, uh, envy is a big part of this. You know, we want what others in our peer group have, or you know, maybe even we want to feel like we're a little bit of ahead of those we compare ourselves to. So you get to the top of the mountain, no, oh, someone else is up there too. Well, maybe we need to to one up them, or, or there's another mountain that we want to climb next. Life is a competition. Um, you know, whether you choose to participate in that competition to to what degree is up to you. No right or wrong, but I mean. We compete for jobs, like you competed to get into med school. You know, we compete for promotions, higher paychecks. We compete for a spouse, a mate. Um, you know, we can, whether you want to believe it or not, uh, or, or admit to it or not, we compare our children to other people's kids. You know, like you know, my kid got straight A's, Ooh, my kid got a DUI. Like we do it, <laughs> right or wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, we just, we compare ourselves to those around us, so that, you know, compare our things to other people's things, our vacations, to other people's vacations, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think that's going to continue to, to push progress forward. And, you know, for, for if any of you out there are kind of doom and gloom, like, oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, run for cover. Like, sure. It might seem like that if you watch the news, but look backwards, you know, any period of time throughout history, the future is often better than the past. And, and we talked about those incremental changes in one of our episodes. You, you don't really notice it from one year to the next, but over a 50, 70 year span, like some of the, like if you, you know, took someone from the 1950s and showed them today's world, like their mind would explode. They would be so impressed and like, oh my gosh, color TV on a 65 inch wall, like everyone has this, like, are you kidding? You have a compute, like what's a computer. You have this thing in your pocket. You can call other people. You can go on the internet. Like, I mean, so many things, health has improved, et cetera. So I think that's, uh, be cautiously optimistic, but I think the future is going to hold some cool stuff that we don't even understand or realize today. Yeah. I think that's so true. It's like we can't anticipate what happens next, but it will happen. Um, okay. So I think one of the other things that's pretty consistent and doesn't change over time with investing and savings is that there's a trade-off between how much risk you take and the potential reward, not necessarily the reward you get, but the potential for reward, <laughs> which is a very an important distinction. So when you're evaluating investment option, there's always inherently that trade-off. So in order to incentivize an investor to take on more risk, a company has to dangle more reward in front of them. And that's why there's this trade-off. Um, or else why would we take that additional risk? Like there's no reason to do that if you could do something else that's safer and get a better return. Like that doesn't make sense logically. So I think bank accounts are a good example. Typically they offer a much lower return because they have some guarantees built in. They're safe. They have FDIC insurance. Even when yields are high, like in high yield savings accounts right now, they're still not necessarily competitive with long term returns in the stock market or what we would expect from something else where we take on more risk. Um, I think bonds are actually a very good example of this because within bonds, there's a lot of different kinds of bonds that you can purchase. And depending on the risk associated with them, you get a higher interest rate return on them or you get a lower interest rate return. So U.S. Treasury bonds are a good example where you have like a, a lower yield than a lot of corporate bonds because they're backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. And even if we are not a super big fan of the U.S. government right this second, they are still paying their bills, even if they can't always pass a budget on time and they have big arguments about it, they're still paying their bills. They still are able to collect taxes. There's just a lot of associated security with the U.S. government from an investing standpoint. So even now, that means something. And then on the opposite of the end of the spectrum, we have high yield bonds, which are literally bonds that offer a higher interest rate yield, a higher payment, because the credit worthiness of the company is lower. And so they have to offer you a higher yield in order for you to be willing to lend them money. Why else would you lend them money if you weren't going to get a higher rate return? Um, and those higher, those high yield bonds can sometimes be, you know, like 
governments that aren't as stable. They can be like corporate bonds again, like companies that aren't quite as stable. And in order to to raise that money, they have to be willing to give more in return or else you wouldn't do it. Yeah. And a free market investor's demand for the potential return of an investment um, to be commensurate with the risk of losing money from your investment. Like, all right, if I buy this bond, there is a 30% chance that I'm going to get nothing back because your company is going to go out of business. So I want double digit interest rates on this bond. Like you need to give me 17% or I'm not giving you money. Yep. Um, you know, and you, you know, we can go up and down the risk spectrum extremes. You know, the most extreme is probably lottery tickets. You know, there's a <laughs> close to a not investment purposes, Corey. No, not investment purposes, but I mean, <laughs> the return potential is insanely high, but the, also the risk of losing your money is close to a hundred percent. Like it's almost <laughs> guaranteed the couple bucks you spend on a Powerball ticket is a couple dollars. You're not seeing back at all. You yeah. Know, every once in a while you might win a dollar or something if you get one of the numbers to match, but most likely you're going to lose it. But the return potential is off the charts. It's just, you know, you're unlikely ever to see that return ever in your lifetime, multiple times over, um, you know, gambling aside, you know, cash, government bonds, corporate bonds, junk bonds, um, you know, really probably the greatest return potential realistically for a type of investment would be starting your own business with your own money. Like, you know, that could have immense returns over your career. That being said, that business has a greater chance of failing than succeeding over the long run. So high return potential, also high risk of failure. Um, you know, next would probably be starting a business with someone else's money and your own money combined or borrowing money to start a business, um, investing in someone else's business and then, you know, leveraged investments. Like you're, you're again, borrowing money to invest in something such as real estate or, um, you know, borrowing money to invest in stocks. Not that I'd recommend that, but if, you know, market goes up, your returns are amplified because you didn't, you know, you, you, you put some money down and borrowed the rest. Um, you don't need amazing returns though, to reach your end goals. You just kind of need okay returns, keep your a healthy savings rate. Um, cause if you're shooting for too high on that return spectrum, you're gonna fall into some, some pitfalls from time to time and, and see some massive losses here and there. So we kind of want to keep those expectations in check, keep the return something that are realistically achievable without taking too much risk. Um, and, and then life will be good. Diversify. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. This is the fun one, the inevitable, but death and taxes. People talk about it all the time. <laughs> I think obviously we need to do some planning for eventually passing away. It's more relevant for some people than for others, but you know, just doing some basic planning for that can be helpful. Having a will, having an estate plan in place. I think taxes are more nuanced. We don't know exactly what they will look like over time, and they may change over time. But in order for modern society to function, there will be taxes of some kind and some amount. Um, I mean, taxes, a lot of the common taxes that we have now originated with the Roman Empire, like sales tax, income tax, property tax, inheritance tax. That's a long history of taxation. Like modern society is built on taxation. It's the government being able to collect taxes to provide like public goods and services and also raise armies and things like that. That's probably how it started was like, oh, let's get some armies. How do we do that? Oh, let's take some money from people. Anyway, so there's a lot more that we potentially get from our taxes now, but we can safely assume that some portion of our earnings will be collected by the government and we have to be prepared for that. Um, and I don't think that anyone expects that to change necessarily, but it's an important part of retirement planning, especially, you know, when we're saving up money, that's great. And some of our money may not be taxed when we're retired, but we do have to be well prepared for what we will potentially have to pay taxes on when we are retired. So there you go. I don't, like, I don't really look at taxes as a bad thing, you know? No. Like, I like mm -mm. roads to drive on, traffic lights, police officers to keep us safe, um, you know, schools to send our kids to. A little bit of a social safety net. 
Yeah. So, I, mean, I think it's, you know, obviously we want to be as smart as possible and be as tax efficient as possible when making financial decisions, but, you know, we don't want to try and cheat the system because then there's going to be less resources available for us and our friends and our neighbors. And, um, but anyways, so yeah, taxes, they're going to be around. So is death plan for that estate planning, you know, insurance for in case you die before you plan to. Uh, and, and your family's not financially ready, but, um, one more before we wrap up that wasn't on those edits that our computer doesn't like us together, Rochelle. <laughs> um, but reality minus expectation equals satisfaction. We've talked about this before, you know, like your expectations of how something is going to pan out versus how it actually does pan out really determines your happiness level. Like I had a meeting with a client yesterday we were fully expecting um, when we did last met over the summer that when her student loan payments resumed, they would be a little over $3,000 per month at her income level. And we did kind of the online estimators. And then we went in yesterday, looked at what the payment was and on that new save plan, you know, what what's the optimal choice? And it turns out her student loan payment is only going to be about $2,600 per month. You know, still a hefty amount, but Hey, it's less than what we expected. Now, if we, in the summer thought that it was going to be at about 2000 a month and turns out to be 2,600, that's going to lead to some disappointment. Same end number. It's just, where did we anchor our expectations? So like, if you expect life to be perfect in all ways, every day is a holiday, every meal is a feast. Like you're going to be constantly disappointed. Um, you know, I think the happiest people in the world are those who really expect very little and are content with what they have. Now, this Absolutely. is the opposite of what fuels progress and growth. Like you need to be unsatisfied in order to push forward, in order to grow, in order to innovate. Um, you know, the the great products, resources, companies, innovations of our time have come from people who said, I don't like what we have. I want something better. Let me create it. And that's going to continue to be the case moving forward. But many of those people are also not very happy. You know, there's yeah. a lot of you know, stories about that. Um, so it, it's <laughs> a little bit of a tug of war battle here, but, but try to keep those expectations in check, you know, try to be content with what you have. That doesn't mean you can't strive to improve, strive for more, but, you know, find that balance, try and be realistic. Um, and, you know, in order to get to that point of financial independence, you have to be able to say, I have enough, which is very difficult to say, you know, I think mm -hmm. I, I forget who said it, um, some famous rich person back in the day, but when asked like how much, you know, it, you know, in terms of money, how much is considered enough? And his answer was just a little bit more. And that's whether you're, you know, just getting started or, you know, a billionaire, like if you just had a little bit more, you'd feel more comfortable and content. Um, we can avoid that being the answer and be like, I don't need more. I have enough. This is enough. Then, then yeah. you can retire and live happily ever after. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay. So in conclusion, there are some things that don't change. We have to be prepared for the inevitable things in life. And, and part of that is like make things easier for yourself because we know we're a little bit lazy on the inside. So if you can automate your savings, make things happen without having to think about it too hard, that's going to be great for your financial plan. And also just be prepared for things to not be easy all the time. Like there will be some pain that's inevitable as well. Um, You have to save. Like if you want to not work at some point, like social security, the taxes that we collect, it's not enough. So just be prepared to save some money so that you don't have to work at some point. If you don't want to work at some point, I guess some people want to work forever, but also inevitably you probably won't be able to work forever unless you die dramatically and very quickly, which is another thing that's inevitable is that someday you will pass away, <laughs> but also that we have to pay taxes while we're alive unless we don't have any money. And yeah. possibly at death, if you're worth enough. Yes, possible. And depending on what state you live in. Yep. Yep. Some things just got to plan for them because we know that they're around. <laughs> Some things will never change. They'll always be the same. All right. Fun one. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thank you, everyone.